Charles Lee is the chief on Hong Kong Stock Exchange, a mainland Chinese banker with Wall Street credentials. Charles Lee earned a journalism degree at the University of Alabama and a law degree from Columbia University before moving to Hong Kong to serve as China chairman for Merrill Lynch and then J.P. Morgan. Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing Limited named him as its next chief executive. Lee grew up in the remote northwestern province of Gansu and learned English by listening to the radio. After a stint as a reporter and editor at the state-run China Daily, Lee applied to the University of Alabama's journalism program. After going on to law school at Columbia, Lee later worked four years as a lawyer for Davis, Polk, and Wardell, and later a predecessor of Sidley Austin LLP before being picked up as head of Merrill Lynch's China operations. Uh, I was born in Beijing, China, but I grew up in the northwest uh, Mongolian, Sino-Russian Mongolian border area. And then I became an offshore oil driller not too far away from Beijing in the North China Sea. Did that for quite a few years, and then I went to a university in south of China called Xiamen University. And I studied English there, met my wife, and uh, so we were together since then. And then from there, I went to uh, China Daily and become a journalist uh, reporting and writing editorial commentaries uh, for that paper uh, from 84 to 86. Um, that was obviously initially assigned by the government because all the graduates from China were assigned at the time. And I was um, you know, lucky enough that I was assigned to uh, a paper which was very new in China, very liberal you know, under the circumstances, uh, as liberal as you could possibly be. In any event, from there, I decided I need to uh, advance uh, my academic pursuit a bit, need to at least get a graduate degree, hopefully in journalism. So that's how I started looking. Um, I mean, it's a long story how it started, but essentially, you know, there was only one big category of uh, American universities in China at the time and uh, in Beijing. So you, you know, stand in line, take a look. So the fact that we are alphabetically li listed early uh, helps. And you look for financial assistance, obviously. That's a key term that you're looking. We don't have Google at the time, obviously. So I choose uh, a few schools, including Alabama, Alaska, Arkansas, a couple at the back, Wisconsin, Wyoming. I don't, I don't think I had anything in the middle other than a couple of schools I already knew. So, but essentially sent them over just uh, saying, you know, I don't really have any money, so if you have to charge an application fee, don't bother returning. Dr. Sloan wrote back and said, uh, we can waive your application fee here at uh, University of Alabama. But the, re re the, the final reason I choose Alabama is, uh, is quite simple, practical, uh, that this is the only school that accepted both my wife and me as a graduate student and with... Uh, uh, teaching us uh, no, research assistantship. That was the only reason why financially we will be able to come. So we came together so that we can be together. And uh, it's a long journey back uh, in 86, but uh, that was the two most beautiful years that we have spent here. And from there, um, I didn't want to go back to China. China was still very chaotic at the time. And uh, I obviously couldn't really get a job. Uh, you know, as a journalist here, not, you know, working in your own native language. Um, so one thing led to another. I got interested in, you know, in the law um, by working here on my thesis in defamation, libel. So I started there, you know, get, you know, very close to law school and thought that was an interesting pursuit. So I, you know, went to Columbia Law School after, um, you know, a master in Alabama in journalism. So I went there and became a lawyer, practiced uh, in New York City for four years uh, on you know, two uh, large Wall Street firms. And from there, a key client of mine was Merrill Lynch. So they decided that uh, it would be much uh, more effective if he could work for on the client side of the business, on the financial services. So I, I went to Merrill Lynch, become an investment banker, uh, and spent two years in New York traveling back and forth doing a lot of uh, still China-oriented work. But ultimately, by mid-90s, uh, I decided to move back to China. So I moved back to Hong Kong, and I spent about nine years working for Merrill Lynch in Hong Kong, but predominantly still Greater China-related financing, M&A, uh, and securities work. So from there, um, 2003, I joined J.P. Morgan. They 
wanted us to start the China franchise, and I started there, so that was six years ago. And I did that, I was chairman of that, uh, their China operations, and that was a challenge, and, and uh, made a substantial progress there. And ultimately, uh, late last year, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange began to approach me, and uh, I didn't think it was a job that I can do well. And um, but ultimately, we convinced uh, uh, you know we, after a lot of discussions, that uh, both they and I felt that this is something that uh, is uh, is probably something quite interesting for for me to do, and is something that I can make a meaningful contribution. Still, a lot to learn, so I'm looking forward to starting next week. I think uh, um, there are three key things that, are, if I think back about things that uh, and you, you need to do as a good leader, you need to think strategically. Uh, that is, you always have to think um, as a leader. You know, leader don't think about a lot of details. You you need to understand the details, but uh, you know, you you must be able to have the bigger picture. And uh, the second is, uh, you really have to build a team. You have to have a team. You know how to w work with people, and uh, particularly people for you. And lastly is how you work with the people. So clearly, number one, you know, think strategically. You know, that's easy, easier said than done, but I, I guess to make it simple, you probably want to say anything that you do, you want to think about, if I'm the first one ever to think about doing this, how would I do it? rather than follow somebody else who have already done it. At least ask that question. And also when you think about the implications of your decision, think that if, if you're the last person that who is going to have to do it and nobody else is going to check on it, so basically if you had done that, you're the last person who have made that decision and it will live on. Um, for better or for worse, the implications will be there. So you have to constantly think about if you're the first one to know it, would you do it some way? If you're the last one to do it, you know, would you do it? So if you think like that, you will very quickly, you know, emerge as somebody who can lead because uh, you have thought about things before anybody else could. So constantly remind yourself, you know, it doesn't matter what other people have done, but if you, so that's really strategic thinking, I would think is very important. Second is working with people. The key is to hire people or, you know, find partners who have skills that you don't have. There's no point, you know, hire uh, a team who, you know, is very much like you. You have to be able to find people who are not like you because uh, then they can help you on things that you're not good at it. So that's how I feel that sometimes you rather hire a handicapped person and, you know, uh, on the arms, for example, but his legs is great or vice versa. You don't want to have a lot of um, people who are all purpose, you know, because if somebody's who really good all around it, number one, it's hard to find them. Number two, it's hard to keep them. And because everybody will agree that, you know, people like that are in high demand. Um, but you want it to somebody, you have to have people who are really good at something. Doesn't have to be good at everything, but has to be really good at something. So if you know how to build a team with everybody who is good at something really, really good, then, you know, you're fine. The last third, is really once you do have a team, how do you work with them? You know, so you have to constantly be what I call confidence boosting, meaning you have to be positive so that they feel that there's a positive energy around you. Number two, you have to do things, uh, behaviors that are trust-seeking. That is, they can trust you. You want them to feel that uh, they can trust you. And how you do that, you know, make sure you give a lot of credit and take a lot of responsibility, not the other way around. And then, you know, you will be, uh, you know, you will be fine. Um, so I, I think that's really uh, what I consider to be uh, successful leaders and have to have. I think uh, leadership, uh, the three key qualities that we talked about in the journalism school, number one, you really need to be smart. You know, usually people want to follow smart people. Nobody wants to follow dumb people. So you have to be smart. You have to have the intellectual capacity to think things earlier, faster, and uh, broader, and on a more macro perspective, number one. 
Number two, you have to have a heart, meaning you have to have the integrity, you'd have to have the honesty, you'd have to have a good value system, and that has to come from the heart. You, it's not something you can pretend, you can something you can artificially put it up. So it's, that's number two. And then the third is communication skills, you know, because at the end of the day, none of your intellect, none of your in, and integrity is going to come out unless you are able to articulate you know, your thoughts and uh, issues in a succinct and uh, you know, effective manner. All leaders are effective communicators. So I would say that that would be the key, key things, uh, you know, for uh, you know, for 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 leader uh, to have. I think it's a started. Uh, um, they started a global search for quite a while, and uh, they used an uh, uh, executive search firm that approached me initially. And, um, and then that is followed with uh, a series of meetings with the board nomination committee and ultimately with the board. And obviously this is a very significant uh, position that has a regulatory function in, ch in, in the government, so therefore it has to be approved by the government. So that's, uh, that's how generally it works. But at the beginning of that process, I wasn't sure this is the right job for me, or more precisely that I was the right person for that job because uh, you know, I was very candid with the, uh, with the recruiting uh, board members that I never before that run a large um, you know, organization. Um, you know, even though J.P. Morgan China was a very big organization, but it's more, I was more on the client side of the business. But this is a, you have to run a very large $20, $20 billion market cap listed company. So number two, I have never, I've been a lawyer before, but I really have not been in the regulatory role before. And obviously this is in Hong Kong and I don't speak the local dialect, which is uh, Cantonese. So that all I felt put me at a significant disadvantage. But in the end, uh, I think the board agreed uh, that uh, those are indeed shortcomings that I need to work on, but they are broader strategic uh, perspectives and uh, and uh, visions and uh, and also leadership skills that I can bring to bear that hopefully could offset some of those weaknesses. So there we are today. I think the Hong Kong structure, if you think about, it's really a three job melded into one. Number one, it's a twenty billion U.S. dollar market cap listed company. So. You know, it has a shareholder, public shareholders. And, you know, it's widely held, uh, you know, by international institutions. So it's a very large listed company. You have to be a CEO of the company and be responsible to the board, to the shareholders, and also to uh, other uh, stakeholders. Second, it's a very large, you know, uh, critical infrastructure, financial infrastructure, or market structure, because it's a trading system. It's an exchange you know, massive amount of uh, securities are traded on that stock exchange with, you know, uh, you know tens of billions of, uh, uh, you know, value, uh, uh, dollar value of stocks being traded every day with a very large, I involving almost, you know, a significant large part of the, uh, the Asia-Pacific uh, uh, financial uh, community. So it's, it's almost like infrastructure. It can't go down, cannot have any problems, and have uh, stakeholders that uh, that have very different interests that you need to manage and balance and trade so that uh, you know uh, it's being uh, indeed almost like a public utility. That's the second job. The third job is the, is a regulator because we're the front run, front line regulator of all the securities industry, and including people who list uh, listed companies, issuers listed here, including investors, hedge fund, investment firms, broker dealers. And, uh, and retail investors. So it's a regulatory job. So it's a listed company, it's a C, you know, CEO management, and the, it's an infrastructure operation. And then it's, um, the, s the second infrastructure operation is highly techni technological oriented. You know, IT innovation is a, is a key cornerstone and components. And then lastly is a, a governmental and regulatory function.
Well, it's very, very difficult to make any predictions, and all the predictions that uh, over the years and, you know, have turned out to be, very few of them have uh, turned out to be right. So it's very hard for me to actually necessarily see what's going to come. But looking back at the last year, uh, it just, uh, I just felt amazing how close we were to a total meltdown. At least that's how everybody is now looking at it and saying that we were very close to a potential meltdown that would lead to a depression, for example, and we were very close to it, but nobody knows how exactly how close we were. Um, nobody thought we would have come out so strongly as we have today. But on the other hand, you also see still that, you know, we seems to be coming out, the, at least the financial market, uh, you know, the stock market, and a lot of this, uh, 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 you know, bond market seems to have really recovered very substantially uh, over the, 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 you know, the valleys of last year. And uh, a lot of people felt that recovery were not justified. A lot of people think the underlying economy is still in a lot of difficulty, and uh, the employment situation is still very tough. Um, so it shouldn't really justify this. Whether this is a, a financial driven and let recovery that we will eventually come up, or there's going to be another double dip, uh, you know, leading to a W shape was of uh, type of a recovery rather than a V type of recovery. But at least it seems to be we're not an L problem that uh, you know it just to stay down and, and you know we seems to have some sectors coming back, even including housing. So clearly we were very different from the 1930s. Uh, the decisiveness of all the global actions by the global government uh, have, making, have made a huge difference because at the end of the day, a financial crisis that we have seen was really a crisis of confidence. The confidence usually, you know, uh, you know feed on each other, feed, uh, you know, it's, it's either become a vicious cycle that you can't stop or can also become a, you know, a virtual cycle. And it seems to be you know, that uh, people are no longer believing the worst case and people are beginning to hope. And those hope reinforce recovery and recovery bring more hope. So hopefully we are seeing the positive spinning of that uh, cycle is no longer a vicious cycle going downward and is beginning to go upward. But I do think next year there are still structure challenges um, but was in China, in the U.S., and everywhere else. Yeah, I think uh, everybody would uh, agree the transparency, more transparency is better. And very few will think that their own market uh, is not transparent or is not as transparent. Everybody thinks that we're just as transparent, if not more. So I think that uh, is, uh, is almost uh, uh, everywhere. But I think uh, um, this is also, uh, it's a highly subjective uh, judgment to make you know, exactly what you mean by transparent. Because all the laws are the same. Because uh, you know, the, the US laws are the ones that are providing almost the example, the blueprint for Hong Kong and also more so for China. And Hong Kong is more of a British system, which is not dissimilar to the American system. But the Chinese, when they put their laws you know, in the, on the books, if you look at their securities laws and their company laws, in many ways they're better. Because they were able to start uh, almost everything else in China. They were able to start everything on a white piece of paper saying, let's start from scratch. They have very little legacy. So they were able to check on everybody's good book and see which one is good and why they did it. Do we have similar issues that they do? And maybe on that issue, we take American example. On the next issue, I take the British example. So the laws are perfect. Does that mean that they are better, they are transparent? You, know, you never know. And also, the two markets, broadly speaking, Hong Kong, China, or the broader greater China market, and the American market, or you know, to a lesser extent, the European, the British market, uh, are philosophically very different in this. And I think transparency is always a goal, but here, um, the f operating philosophy is investors are adults. You just need to tell them honestly what is going on, and they will make a decision on their own. So the focus on telling the truth and telling, you know, you have to, you cannot misstate material facts, or you cannot, uh, you know, m you know, miss uh, or, or, or material facts. So it's really put the burden on the issuer to 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 come clean. 
but you know you can sell garbage as long as you tell people it's garbage and if people still want to buy garbage that's their, their problem so that's the operating philosophy here but there the philosophy is very different they think the investors are little guys who need to be protected so they not only they are saying you have to disclose they actually very invasively and intrusively check and see what well, this business shouldn't really be listed or that business unless you change that unless you do that unless you do this we really think it's good for you because you could be trouble so from that perspective you know it's also you know meant well and you know so therefore a lot of people think uh, you know the regulatory system there is a little bit burdensome it's hard because you don't really know what the questions they're going to have what the SEC is easy but but you know on the other hand with all the new changes here a lot of people don't want to come to American to list because the liabilities they put in there is so much the you know the they basically you know, the class actions you the plaintiff bar and all the things are also very significant uh, deterrent as well but they obviously help uh, the system and there the reason they have their philosophy is they don't have the private enforcement mechanism that is exists in here whether it is the class action suit or other you know actions you could bring against the uh, and also but then you know so uh, you know uh, since i'm jumping back and forth between the two worlds I can see the perspective quite a bit, and uh, you know a lot of Americans saying, "Well, you guys really have a lot of corruption. You know, you have a lot of this and that." They're right, but you know the Chinese are also saying, "Well, yeah, you have a great system, but your regulator are not able, even not close to catching all the you know all the cats that 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 are so much smarter, so much faster, and they are able to perpetrate fraud on so much uh, larger scale." I think uh, you know. I remember the first ten years of my practice there. I w I was able to be on a higher moral ground and was able to lecture uh, in Chinese a lot. It's very hard to do it now with the you know with the the Bernard, um, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, with the uh, Madoff with Bernard Madoff, with uh, all the other scandals. So here. You probably hard to corrupt an SEC official. It's almost next to impossible to you know do anything there, but you're able to perpetrate perpetrate a massive scale, you know, fraud, and in many ways the the derivative industry you know was also getting a little bit out of control. So the Chinese would argue that yes, all the great system you have there, but all this innovation is able to completely wreck the whole thing. Uh, yeah, we may have a few bad apples, but you know what? The worst they can do is to cheat a few, you know, investors. Here, you could have the whole system wrecked by just a few bad apples. Who is better? So that argument is going to continue. So I think transparency as a value judgment is something that we all strive to achieve, but is not something that uh, easily achievable, and is also in different people's mind. You know, that may mean different things. No, actually, I think most of the standards, one way or another, are already global. I don't think uh, you know there is an American standard, a European standard, an Asian standards. You know, all the philosophical differences I was talking about are more approaches, perspectives, and focus and emphasize. But in terms of the essence of the law, in terms of the essence of the enforcement, even the cultural perspectives are coming closer rather than uh, apart. So I think uh, we will see much, much more coordinated. Global efforts. I'm going to be in New York next week, for example, on the conference of global exchange CEOs, and there is a regulatory summit. You know, the the regulators are getting together because they all know that uh, there's no point just uh, watching out your home territory because a lot of things happen thousands of miles away. In almost a second, can start to have an impact in your home market. So you know, you're not alone. You're not isolated. We're together. Yeah, I mean, you know, in many ways we are uh, we are a completely uh, international company. If you talk, you know, um, talk to most of our senior management, they are either Westerners, um, you know, themselves, or you know, returnees, and you know, who, who you know who lived here many many years. Even the people who are you know from Hong Kong or China, 
and you know they they you know the working language is English, so it's completely operated, and our shareholder base is global. You know, our largest shareholder is the government, which only control uh, which only has six percent. The rest are widely held by institutions. So in many ways, we deal with. Uh, our shareholders and deal with the media, deal with the analyst community completely like uh, any other Western listed company. There is no real differences there. And uh, for communication uh, professionals, obviously, the most important, which sometimes get overlooked, is that they know the business, because uh, you know um, there is a constant uh, you know uh, battle between do you want to hire somebody who is a great communicator or you hire somebody who knows the business very well. I think sometimes the, the, the balance shifts toward the communicator. Um, but in this environment, in this uh, uh, um, post-crisis, there's a lot of skepticism out there. There are a lot of uh, hard questions people want to ask. And uh, you know, if, you only just, uh, if you are perceived to be a good spin master but doesn't have the substances back it up, that can backfire. And uh, so therefore, uh, as communication officers, you really, really need to understand the business, understand why, you know, you need to understand the CEO's thinking so that you speak in synchron with what he, his strategic opportunity uh, uh, visions are. At the same time, you really need to understand what the market want and understand the business, be able to go back and to response, uh, respond uh, accordingly. Uh, yes, uh, but most of the substantive business that you have to learn going to have to be in the real world rather than in schools. So uh, I think uh, you know on the one hand, you know if you had a business degree, um, you know maybe that helps on the vocabulary, help on the understandings. But the only thing it did is really just give you a couple of years, uh, you know, uh, a leg ahead in terms of uh, a little bit of the uh, the, the basics. As long as you're, uh, you know, if you, alternatively you want to spend time here, and then you can work on the other skill. I mean, I consider all these key components of your weaponry, all the, all, you know, different pieces. You have to have about 10 pieces, for example, to be successful. So whether you get a piece here now or a piece later then, that's really different people have different uh, priorities. I, I wouldn't really not hung over, uh, we, oh, he get a better piece. Yeah, he get that piece, but you get the other piece, and by the time he get, he he's going to have to focus on, you know, the piece you just got, and you know, so ultimately, you know, over time, in five six years after you graduate, you know, people come, you know, about with all the pieces they need. It's really how to use the pieces and that make the difference, and uh, whether you make or break a leader is really after that. So I would not, I would tell the students, don't you know, just go with your heart, and because all this uh, investment you're making. You know, you know this. You know, if you have to buy ten stocks anyway, so you only have money to buy A stock. Fine, buy it then. But if you feel the heart is for B stock, okay, that's too. That's okay. But the other guy is going to come back and pick up the B stock too. You're going to go there, so don't worry about it. I think, uh, in fact. Uh, um, this is already a subject that a lot of people has been debating and working over the last 20 years and maybe 10 years, and a lot of people paid a lot of price for um, having made mistakes on that. So a lot of people probably are getting this right already because you need to have the right balance between the best practices, the best behavior, uh, the best compliances, and the best uh, business philosophical, uh, best business philosophies. You know that have been developed and tested over many years here and globally. That uh, you need to keep that because that's why you know you're successful over time. On the other hand, you need to apply that in a local community, in a local environment that fits. You know you cannot just uh, you know just uh, push it onto the local practice and um, without understanding the local practice. And so I think uh, the, the people are beginning to get that balance right. You know, you need to have, you know, a, a clearly local friendly, local environmental friendly. You need to be able to eat their local food without going into problems. So, for example, the Chinese keep saying, you know, um, "Forget about that and respect that." Um, so clearly, the people are working on that balance now. 
uh, I think they mostly are getting it right. Um, I think w the most effective way of preserving the best practices you already have at the same time without suffering local in, uh, you know, uh, indigestions, for example, is for you to understand the locals. Because in many ways, the Chinese understand this, the Western systems a lot better than the Westerners understand them. Not because they're smarter, it's just because they need to catch up, they need to learn. So they, you know, if you talk to regulators and talk to my contemporaries, but the best lessons I learned in China is that I used to know a lot of th how a lot of things are done but I really don't know why they were done. But a lot of the people in China who have to make decisions up front, they have to buy a, a new system, for example, they have to come up with a new law, for example, they have to enter into a new joint venture. When they start to do this, they have very little to go by as to whether they should do it or not. So they need to make sure they understand if we have to do this way, why? You know, we understand how, because the why is being taken care of by, you know, it's just being done that way. You know, we always done that way, and I don't really know why, but ask uh, whoever. But the Chinese, they always ask why. And as a result, sometimes they feel that, oh, the, the thing, the way you're doing that was supposed to address a problem of A, but we don't have a problem in A in China. We have a problem B. How would that address that? So they need to really understand the essence, a lot of the philosophical issues behind a lot of the way we do things here. And they were able to respond. I think the Western companies would, you know, make a lot of progress if they were able to, you know, to understand that perspective so that uh, nobody wants to go into China and start to say, oh, let's do this Chinese way. Because there is, you know, they, they, they feel from, you know, the system institutionally has a certain be best practice behavior. You need to preserve that, but you need to preserve it, you know, you know, to be incorporated and combined with the local customs. Well, I mean, you know, uh, in the, let's just only talk about the auto industry for now. And, you know, it's very easy. Almost everybody has a joint venture in China. But the most successful are General Motors in Shanghai and Volkswagen in Changchun. And also, they also, Volkswagen also has a Shanghai, very large Shanghai operations. Um, I have not studied their story uh, you, you know, well enough for me to be able to say why they did right. But the fact is, General Motors may not have got a lot of things right, but they got the China piece right and the China joint venture right. And um, the Chinese are learning the hard lessons because they are trying to, you know, be in Korea, trying to be in America, and trying to be in Australia. They will bump into, they bump into a lot of problems. And uh, it's a very, very, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, a big, big wake-up call and uh, experience for them as well.